In this video, we are going to discuss the programming process for multiprocess. So in many of the previous videos, we've talked about the hardware support required for these multiprocess, but we haven't spent a lot of time about the exact programming process. So let's look at the two main styles that one would use to program these, these multiprocess. So the first one is referred to as shared memory. And in this model, you are taking an application and you're breaking it up into multiple threads. And all of these threads are going to share one common pool of memory. And everybody agrees on how to address this memory. So there could be a variable over here which is visible to all of these threads. So one of these threads could issue a load and it produces the appropriate address. And from that address, you get the value and bring it into some register. And similarly, a thread over here could also issue a load to that exact same address and the value is brought from that address and put into some register over here. And similarly, you could also do a store to that address and so that puts a value from a register into that location. And so if one of these threads were to do a load to that same location, you would get this newly written value and you would place it into a register. Okay, so this is essentially a little bit like a bulletin board where everyone can post whatever they, they want and you can read whatever message is already placed on that bulletin board. So this model was introduced because it was assumed that an interface like this makes it very easy for threads to produce values and pass it on to any other threads that want to consume that value, right? There's no explicit sending of messages between these threads. All you have to do is produce a value and put it into a known memory location and anyone else who wants to read that value simply has to do a load from that memory location. The second approach is referred to as message passing, where again you take an application and you break it up into multiple threads. And the key difference here is that each thread has its own private pool of memory. And this private pool of memory is not visible to any of the other threads. So when this thread does a load, it has to produce an address that is sitting in its own local memory. And so that load can only retrieve a value from here and place it into a register. Similarly, someone doing a load here gets a value from local memory and puts it into a register. And then if you do a store, you're taking a value from a register and putting it into some memory location in your own private memory. So how exactly do you exchange values between threads, right? So if I produce a value that someone else needs to read, what I have to do is create a specific send message over here. And when I call a send operation or when I invoke a send function, it invokes an operating system call or a user level library call. And so you have software that assembles a packet together. So it's going to create a packet. It's going to take values from your local memory. You're going to put it into this packet. And then you're going to send this packet over the network to some other thread. And so when this thread receives that value, right? So the program would have to have an explicit receive message here. So when you execute a receive function, you are telling the operating system or a user level library function to receive a certain packet take the data payload that is sitting in that packet and put it into your local memory. And now if I do a load from that location, I get the value and put it into a register, right? So it takes a number of steps to actually communicate a value from one thread to another thread. You have to do it in software by invoking a send and a receive function. And then the underlying operating system or library takes over, you know, creates a packet in software and then sends out a message over the network, right? So the assumption is, that there is some kind of network that connects all of these nodes. And so you're sending a message over that, over that network. Okay, so what are the differences between these, these two styles? So with a shared memory model, again, as I said, the assumption is that this makes programming a little easier because you don't have to explicitly send values back and forth, but you're putting some responsibility on the hardware because when you do a load, it is up to the hardware to interpret exactly where that data is sitting. You need a shared bus or you see, need some kind of network that connects the shared memory to all of these processes. And then you also need some support for hardware cache coherence because each one of these threads, each one of these multiprocess has a cache as well. And so when you do a load, the value may be sitting in this cache. So when somebody else does a store, you have to let other caches know that a value has been changed and you have to update that value, right? So there is underlying support from the hardware to make sure that this data exchange is, is performed correctly. With the message passing programming model, you are almost putting zero overhead on the hardware, right? All you need is a bunch of processes and you need them connected with some simple network, even an ethernet connection is enough. 
And the way you exchange data values back and forth is with these send and receive calls. Right? So this one, this approach here is a little hardware intensive, but it makes programming presumably easier because the programmer is not burdened with having to think about how to exchange values back and forth. The message passing model is not hardware intensive, so it works with very simple hardware. But the programmer is responsible for data exchange. Right? And so in some sense, it is software cache coherence where if you have a value that somebody else needs to see, you have to explicitly send that message to whoever needs to see it. So those are the major trade-offs. And you know, back when these models were coming up in the 90s, even though shared memory was supposed to be easier to program with, message passing ended up being adopted more broadly. And one of the reasons for that is these shared memory multiprocessors were very expensive. And most people writing parallel programs were expert programmers that you know maybe worked in a national lab, were responsible, let's say, for some weather simulation or some other scientific workload. And they were willing to put in the time to really optimize their code with message passing, right? So with message passing, you can potentially produce code that is a little bit faster because you have exact knowledge about who needs to see a value. And so you can reduce the number of messages and make sure that a value gets gets pushed to whoever needs to see it in the near future. Whereas with shared memory, in some sense, the hardware kind of pulls a value towards itself when you issue a load. So that turns out to be a little bit slower in many cases. And there are also these invalidation messages that go out, even though a thread may not be interested in that value anymore. So with message passing, you can get slightly higher performance if you're willing to invest the effort and about 10 years ago, most parallel programs were being written by expert programmers who were willing to put in that effort. As we move into the multi-core era, shared memory may again become more popular because it makes parallel programming more easily accessible to the masses because this programming model is perhaps a little bit more intuitive and it takes away the burden of doing explicit data exchange away from the programmer. So we're kind of seeing that you know these different models uh, vary in their popularity based on what the underlying hardware platforms are. So let's understand these models a little bit better. Uh, let's look at an example program. So here's one example scientific application. This is referred to as the ocean kernel. And what it's doing is it's modeling the temperature of different particles in the ocean. And so what it does is in every single time step, the new temperature of a molecule is determined by the average temperature of itself and its neighboring molecules, right? So you go through an iteration where you update the temperature of every single molecule based on the values of the neighbors. Then you do another iteration and, and, and so on. And you keep doing this until the values kind of converge. So here is how I would write that program if you ask me to write a single threaded application. So you start with the procedure, you set some initial variables to zero, and then you're going to loop until your values have converged. Okay, so this loop over here is the main part where I'm iterating over a two-dimensional array, right? So I start over here and I just basically keep going left to right until I get to the very end. And in each step, I'm taking the average of myself and my neighbors. And I've also kept track of the old value. Then I look at how much the new value is different from the old value. And then I update a diff variable that keeps track of how much all the molecules have collectively deferred from their old values. Once you are done going through this entire two-dimensional array, I'm going to check to see if the difference is within a certain threshold. If it is, then it means that my solution has converged. So I said done equals one, and that gets me out of this while loop. Okay, so this is how I would write a single-threaded program that goes through this two-dimensional array, computes the new values, keeps track of the difference, and then decides whether you're done or not.